Okay, we now have the privilege of announcing our keynote speaker. Okay, so we are announcing Mary Jane Rubenstein, who is the Dean of the Social Sciences and Professor of Religion, Science, and Society, Philosophy, and Feminist, Gender, and Sexuality Studies at Wesleyan University. She is the author of numerous books on the intersections of science and religion, including Astrotopia, The Dangerous Religion of the Corporate Space Race, and Pantheologies, Gods, Worlds, and Monsters. Um, we cannot say enough how excited we are to have you here today, so much so that I spilled my coffee when she walked into the room. <laughs> yes. Without further ado. Yes. Good morning, my friends. Let me take a moment to get acquainted with this microphone and see how it... Um, there, there were folks standing. Please take your time to make yourselves comfortable um, and put yourselves wherever you'd like to be. Um, thank you both so much for the honor of that introduction. I'd also like to thank Mary Evelyn and John for that beautiful update, um, for the welcome here today, and most of all for the work that the two of you have done to establish the field that we're all working working in today um, to, you know, till the soil and plant the seeds and water the stuff and just do it and do it even when it looked like nothing was going to come of it. Um, and 25 years later, here we are. Thank you so much for all of that work that you've done to prepare a place for us to work in. Thank you to Chris Frymouth. Where are you? You're over there. Thank you so much for the invitation, the honor of this invitation for arranging the details of my visit from the northern wilds of Middletown, Connecticut. Um, it's an honor to be among you today to kick off this marvelous conference filled with the work of such extraordinary scholars. Honestly, I couldn't stop reading the website. I was like, oh my gosh, these people exist and they're doing such beautiful things. Um, I've been asked today to give an introduction to the work that I've done on pantheism, which is that universally detested idea that God and the universe are the same thing. Um, I should say from the outset, uh, for better or worse, that I'm not a theologian or a philosopher in anything like a first order sense. That is, I'm not saying in what follows that God is the universe or the universe is God or that you should be a pantheist or that everyone should be a pantheist. What I'm saying is as we go about thinking about ecological crisis and ecological possibility and even maybe ecological flourishing, and I'm thinking here about the beautiful work that you're all doing on uh, CSAs, on divine rivers, on the divine horizon, on sacred soil, critterly sympoesis, nuclear disaster. In all of these reflections, it could be instructive to consider the limit case of this allegedly insane idea that the universe might be what we mean when we talk about God. Why do Western philosophy and theology find this idea so totally repellent? And insofar as it is so totally repellent, why do they make it up in the first place? After all, the word pantheism is a Greek neologism. The whole idea is a product of the very Western tradition that despises it. Specifically, the allegedly insane notion of pantheism emerges in the early and mid-modern period, as we'll see, as the West is increasingly encountering the lives and practices and ontologies of black, Asian, and indigenous human beings. This, the dead white guy's fear, is what happens to proper thinking when it gets too entangled with the deranged ramblings of non-Westerners. We start divinizing the material, the dark, the feminine, or in the earthly. So here's where things start getting interesting to me from an ecological perspective. If, as we suspect, there is something ecocidal about Western metaphysics, the way it divinizes humanity, the way it yearns for divine embodiment and denies holiness or even agency to the more than human world, then those of us who are looking to undermine the murderous grasp it still has on us, not through philosophy or theology at this point, but through their secularized outcroppings in global capital and technoscience, those of us who are seeking some kind of ecological practice and thinking might do well to ask what on earth pantheism is, why it's so threatening to the Western order that produces it in the first place, and what constructive forms it might actually take. So here we go. 
Part one, there's a slide you've seen before. In 1697, okay, so we're late 17th century here, we can like dial it back, dust it up, we're in sepia. The 17th, late century, <laughs> we're in that kind of tone. The French philosopher Pierre Bayle published his historical and critical dictionary, an eclectic, rambling compendium whose footnotes comically outweigh its main text and whose essays illuminate the lives and works of biblical figures, monarchs, a couple of Asian empires, and an exceedingly strange smattering of philosophers known for its thoroughgoing skepticism, its lewd anecdotes, and its defense of religious and political tolerance, Bale's dictionary quickly became the philosophical bestseller of the 18th century, influencing every classic Enlightenment thinker from Diderot to Voltaire to David Hume, Thomas Jefferson, and Herman Melville, whom we will see again. Throughout these entries, Bale's tone, you should read it, is strident and uncompromising. He seeks to undermine nearly every position he considers, following an idea Socratically and with a heavy dose of crankiness until it collapses under its own weight. Even for the acclimated reader, however, it can be unsettling four volumes in, to stumble upon Bale's frankly unmeasured screed against Baruch Spinoza. Calling Spinoza a Jew by birth and afterwards a deserter from Judaism and lastly an atheist, Bale does not even take the time to explain those Spinozan arguments he clearly despises. As far as he is concerned, even the most cursory glanced by the dullest of humans will reveal that Spinoza's philosophy surpasses all the monstrosities and chimerical disorders of the craziest people who were ever put away in lunatic asylums. What is this surpassing monstrosity, this chimerical lunacy? Bale only says it once, as if dwelling on it any longer might make it contagious. Hiding it in a footnote, in a subordinate clause, he mentions in passing that the insanity at hand is Spinoza's identification of thought and extension. And here we're all like, oh no, you can't identify thought and extension. Seriously though, what does this mean? Thought and extension, often colloquialized as mind and body, were for the earlier philosopher, René Descartes, two distinct substances, meaning each of them was self-sufficient, inhering in no greater thing, right? There's mind and that's a set of things. There's body, that's a set of things. There's no thing of which those two are subsets, right? Against Descartes, Spinoza insisted that mind and body were merely two attributes of the same substance, which he called God, or nature. So here's our monstrosity. According to Spinoza, God and nature are the same thing. As he hastily mentions in his theological political treatise, the power of nature is the divine power and virtue and the divine power is the very essence of God. But I prefer to pass this by for the present. Now, if we don't let him pass it by and linger for a moment with the mathematics of this passing phrase, we will see that if the power of nature is the divine power, and if the divine power is the essence of God, then by the transitive principle, seventh grade math, the power of nature is the very essence of God. The universe we are in, and which in turn is in us, is what we mean when we say the word God. Unexpected? Perhaps. Unorthodox? Yeah. Heretical even, sure. But why does Pierre Bale keep calling it monstrous? In a lecture on abnormality, Michel Foucault explains, the monster is essentially a mixture it's a mixture of two realms, the animal and the human, or of two species, of two individuals, of two sexes, of life and death. Finally, it's a mixture of forms, the transgression of natural limits, the transgression of classifications, of the table and of the law as table. This is actually what's involved in monstrosity. So monsters mix things that ought to be opposed, like this fellow here, a manticore, with the body of a lion and the head of a human. In other renditions, manticores also have the tail of a scorpion and the wings of a bat. So monsters are mixtures. 
Now what Foucault means here by the table and the law as the table is the whole chart of opposites that Aristotle ascribes to to Pythagoras. That chart that Western philosophy keeps extending and expanding. This thing, you've seen this, it's from Aristotle's metaphysics. That table that opposes mind to body, human to animal, male to female, the unchanging to the changing, the rational to the irrational, the spiritual to the material, perfection, light to dark. We could honestly go on like this for days, piling on oppositions, adding characteristics to each of these two teams of Western metaphysics, which is to say, team good on the left and team not so good on the right. And as we might notice, the first of these teams includes all of the characteristics we associate with God, whereas the second includes the characteristics we associate with the world or creation or nature. God is anthropomorphic, unchanging, rational, light-filled, masculine, all the rest, while the world is animal, vegetal, changeable, irrational, dark, and feminine. When Spinoza tells us that God is the world then, he is mixing up traits that any sane philosophy would keep separate, violating the law of the table. How on earth could earth be divine? After all, as Bale reminds us, matter is the vilest of all beings, the, there we are, the theater of all sorts of changes, the battleground of contrary charges, the subject of all corruptions and generations. In a word, matter is the being whose nature is most incompatible with the immutability of God. By mixing the spiritual and the material, the creator and the created, or God and nature. Spinoza, therefore, gives us not just any old monstrous hypothesis, but for Bale, the most monstrous hypothesis that could be imagined, the most absurd and the most diametrically opposed to the most evident notions of our mind. Again, Bale tends to be a cantankerous writer. But his essay on Spinoza is a particularly egregious compendium of unsubstantiated name-calling. In addition to the repeated charges of monstrosity, Bale dubs Spinoza's teachings absurd, horrible, and vile, his ethics uh, an execrable abomination, his metaphysics poppycock, and his theological political treatise a pernicious and detestable book. (laughs) And such insults are hardly limited to Bale. As you may know, one of Spinoza's contemporaries infamously wrote that his treatise had been forged in hell by a renegade Jew and the devil. And the source of this abomination, the professed identity of God and nature, is the position that yet another anti-Spinozist will in just a few years' time derisively name pantheism. Etymologically, Pantheism names the identification of pan, topan, or the all in Greek, with theos, or God. But from there, the term means wildly different things depending on how you define that all. We hit another definitional roadblock when we realize that pantheism is more often a polemical term than one of positive identification. Put Simply, there are more voices saying you're a pantheist and that's absurd than my doctrine is pantheist and this is what that means. Casually, the term pantheism tends to connote personal or communal reverence for nature, that amorphous terrain overseen in Greek mythology by the goat god Pan, a monstrous mixture of divinity, animality, and humanity. Literarily, pantheism erupts through Renaissance, pastoral, and romantic poetry, often in the form of the goat god himself, who arrives on the scene to play the pipes, lounge with shepherds, dance in caves, chase nymphs, and generally put the pan in pansexual. (laughs) Philosophically, however, Pantheism remains little more than a limit case, the position nearly everyone wants to avoid regardless of theoretical orientation. Even contemporary commentators on Spinoza, if they like him, will say he wasn't really a pantheist. So for theists, atheists, rationalists, empiricists, and idealists alike, pantheism has been from the beginning the school to which one simply does not adhere. In fact, it is so universally maligned that pantheism isn't a school at all or even really a halfway decent concept. 
With the exception of some transcendentalists who wouldn't admit it, Emerson deleted it from his long essay Nature, and some Germans who abandoned it when they got older, <clears throat> Schleiermacher, pantheism is, for the most part, just a nasty name to call someone whose position a philosopher hates. But why? What is the matter with pantheism? To begin, it might help to address this particular question with its obverse, namely, why does the position in question keep arising? such that it needs to be so repeatedly denounced. The very frequency and tenor of anti-pantheistic proclamations suggests there might be something alluring about this abominable position. In short, there would be need, no need to reject it so constantly and so irritably if it weren't so strangely compelling. In the mid-19th century, for example, a slew of treatises were written to combat the raging pantheism allegedly devouring the American literary landscape, and each of these treatises exhibits a kind of revolted fascination with the heresy in question. One particularly vilifying tract, you can see where this was, but it all happened here, folks, <laughs> right here. This is the work of Nathaniel Smith Richardson, an Anglican divine in a transcendentalist New England that is just starting to catch the fervor of spiritualism. Okay, so that's what's raging here. Over the course of a lively and panicked defense of Christian orthodoxy, Richardson calls pantheism a misguided, dangerous, anti-intellectual, and even appalling movement. At the same time, Richardson concedes that he can see why pantheism has swept up the young and unchurched. There is a generosity about it, he admits, and a kindliness that is captivating. The kindly generosity of pantheism, of course, is its attribution of godliness to all things. It's coloring the whole world divine as if it bore in its hand the wand of an enchanter. It is a gorgeous vision. Richardson writes, and no wonder that souls craving for rest and finding none should gladly yield themselves to its bewitching power. Note the feminized and sexualized language with which this enchanting, bewitching, and gorgeous power is rendered. As it turns out, this metaphoric register courses throughout this whole anti-pantheist genre. Thus, the Reverend Morgan Dix of Trinity Church, Manhattan, warns that men lacking in sufficient education may have been tempted, seduced, tainted, poisoned by pantheism, unawares. Similarly, Alexis de Tocqueville fears that pantheism ranks among those philosophies most likely to entice the human mind in democratic ages, and Herman Melville's Ishmael confesses while meditating on the mysterious divine Pacific that, lifted by these eternal swells, you must needs own the seductive God, bowing your head to Pan. Melville himself evidently struggled with such revolting uh, seductions. Writing to Nathaniel Hawthorne, for example, Melville meditates on Goethe's infamously pantheist injunction to live in the all. Goethe is a pantheist, but live in the all, says Goethe. What nonsense, writes Melville. Here is a fellow with a raging toothache. My dear boy, Goethe says to him, you are sorely afflicted with that tooth, but you must live in the all, and then you will be happy. There is an immense deal of flummery in Goethe, writes Melville, before going on immediately to admit that there is also, in proportion to my own contact with him, a monstrous deal of it in me. And there's that word again. If what is monstrous about pantheism is its co-inherence of opposites, then it is perhaps unsurprising to find it provoke an affectively co-inherent response. The monstrous mixture of creature and creator gives rise to a monstrous mixture of attraction and repulsion, of loathing and longing, of I hate this thing, but I can't seem to think about anything else. Part two. In her feminist decoding of Plato's cave, Luce Arigara, I remember her, uh, reminds us of the raging ambivalence that Western philosophy, like the Freudian subject, sustains toward its feminized origins. 
Like the Oedipal child, the Western tradition aims to make its way from the dark maternal womb space to the father's blinding light, from paganism to monotheism, from the cave to the sky, from the dirt to the ideas. The mother, along with the wife who eventually stands in for her, thus becomes a complex site of disgust and desire, of repudiation and nostalgia, as the Oedipal man, like the whole phallocentric Western order, simultaneously commands and rejects everything associated with her. A testimony to the steady reduplication of this violent ambivalence, we find a similar structure in Orientalist and primitivist discourses. In such renderings, Western scholars and colonial officials both glorify and vilify a simultaneously seductive and repulsive racialized other who is rendered in consistently dark, primitive, and feminine terms. And indeed, something of the dark, primitive, and feminine fuels the revoltingly attractive power of pantheism. Take, for example, Richardson's above-mentioned treatise, which begins by proclaiming pantheism is the child of the mysterious East. As evidence, Richardson imagines a nameless Indian sage in some dim and fragrant grove or silent mountain cavern from which he dreams up the absurd idea that even dark and earth-born masses are suffused with a divine expression of the one animating spirit. Thanks to its radical egalitarianism, Richardson admits, pantheism is a captivating philosophy. The problem is that it threatens to keep captivating such that it becomes an appalling movement. Appalling but effective, the ambivalence piles up, to the extent that pantheism in Europe and the West is destined to become the correlative of Buddhism in the East, right? He sees it coming, it's taking over. Such widespread pantheist seduction, Richardson insists, can only be counteracted by a straightforward proclamation of Christian orthodoxy above all things, he declares, let there be a plain, distinct, and dogmatic teaching of the incarnation of the eternal word. This is a reference, of course, to the appearance of God in human form in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. What Richardson is suggesting is that the incarnation will invalidate pantheism once and for all by insisting that God came into the world as one man, not all of humanity, and far less the whole animal, vegetable, mineral world. What panics Richardson about the advance of pantheism, right? It's creeping in from the East. A lot of times Westerners, Western philosophers will refer to Spinoza as an Oriental philosopher, right? This idea comes at us from the East. What panics Richardson is not simply the demise of Christendom. Rather, what he seems to fear above all is a collective racialized unmanning. Pantheism, he predicts, will continue to seduce what he calls rosy and Western men into pseudo-Buddhist inertia until they become like the earth-born Indian sage who allegedly dreams his life away in womanly inactivity. As we saw in Bale then, Richardson's own horror in the face of pantheism amounts to a revulsion at blurred distinctions and crossed boundaries of East and West, passivity and activity, femininity and masculinity, darkness and light. Almost too perfectly for those of us on the lookout for monstrosities, Richardson concludes his treatise by lambasting the plan to expand the Parisian pantheon's collection to the Eastern world, turning it thereby into what Richardson calls a pantheistic temple. He shudders to imagine the pantheon's pristine halls crowded with such horrors as the Brahmin cow, the Persian griffin, the Chaldean sphinx, all revoltingly seductive mixtures of divinity and animality. Accelerating what he calls the spreading evil of pantheism, such a beastly temple would invite an ungodly swarm of Eastern chimerical divinities into the anthropomorphic heart of Christian Europe. Paris, turning its pantheon into a a pantheon, right? (laughs) At the other end of the same Orientalist scale, we find British philosopher Constance Plumptree's initially anonymous general sketch of the history of pantheism, which celebrates precisely the pantheist consummation of Christianity that Richardson fears. Seeking a fully rational, fully European religion, 
Plumtree disavows any connection to the barbarous Semites and Greeks and turns instead to what she calls the more refined and cultured East. Relying on Max Mueller, she argues that the true ancestors of the Europeans are Aryans, authors of the Vedas. And fortunately, it is in the Vedas that we find for the first time pantheism itself in its full growth and maturity. By means of a highly seductive reading of highly selective translations, Plumtree maintains that the Vedas teach oneness and interiority, which she claims are far superior to the multiplicity and externality of the savage Greeks and Jews. Ultimately, Plumtree hopes Europe will recover its true origins in India so it can purify its heathenized Christianity into a monistic Aryan pantheism. Now, while this glowing representation of allegedly Eastern pantheists might seem a radical departure from Richardson's anti-pantheism, we find in this text the same Orientalist traits simply transvalued. First of all, Plumtree reserves her praise for the light-skinned monistic Brahmins, ridiculing the primitive polytheism of the darker castes. Second, like Richardson, Plumtree attributes a quiet passivity to these so-called Hindus, who she insists may be regarded as a religious, contemplative, and philosophical race, far more than an active, warlike, or historical race. And although Plumtree praises these qualities rather than calling them, say, effeminate, her representation nevertheless serves to reaffirm Western dominance over the East. For as Richard King has argued, these sorts of depoliticized representations justified British colonial rule by suggesting that the people of India weren't interested in governing, so the British might as well do it for them. Just like the anti-pantheist literature, Plumtree's fascinated adoption of the East serves to reaffirm the West's superiority over it. Okay, fast forward. If Plumtree mobilizes pantheism in service of the Western tradition, feminist philosopher Grace Jansen mobilizes pantheism against it. Remember that old Aristotelian table of opposites? If you're the product of any even remotely deconstructive discipline, then you're bored to tears looking at this slide. This set of oppressive dualisms has been the target of feminist, post-colonial, decolonial, materialist, queer, trans, and critical race theories for decades. What Jansen began to argue in the late 1990s, however, was that the reason this structure still won't budge is that we haven't yet managed to destroy its root, which is to say, the opposition between God and world. As she ventures, if pantheism were seriously to be entertained, the whole Western symbolic would be brought into question. Pantheism rejects the split between spirit and matter, light and darkness, and the rest. It thereby also rejects the hierarchies based on these splits. Therefore, Jansen suggests, any discipline that seeks to unearth and dismantle structures of oppression should adopt an ontology of pantheism. Understandably, many such disciplines want nothing to do with any sort of theism at all. Right? Can you imagine going to your American Studies Department and being like, you all need to become pantheists? They'd be like, no, come, leave me alone, div school. Right? Um, most of our disciplines, our secular disciplines, have had more than enough of the patriarchal guy in the sky. From Jansen's perspective, however, however, this academic circumvention of theology ends up leaving God intact as a concept. And the concept of God goes on to valorize the disembodiment, omnipotence, and anthropomorphism that it divinizes. In this sense, Jansen suggests, pantheism is a far more radical position than atheism, which ends up reinscribing the concept of the very God it doesn't believe in, right? I'm an atheist. I don't believe that there's such thing as a disembodied dude God in the sky, right? For all of their disagreement with theists, atheists agree that if there were a god, he would be, for example, anthropomorphic, masculine, all-powerful, and immaterial. Throughout her argument, then, Jansen is careful to explain that she's not working from a realist stance. Rather, she's working at the level of the symbolic. Jansen is not saying that God is the universe or that the universe is divine. Rather, she is trying to recode divinity as a concept. Whether or not an entity called God exists, she is aiming at discursively aligning godness with the vibrant multiplicity of the material world itself, right? If there were a God, this is what we would mean by it. 
for the sake of our threatened planet and in solidarity with those whom the Father aligned continue to master, denigrate, and destroy. Jansen calls upon feminist philosophers to do the same. Unsurprisingly, for the student of the history of this term, pantheism, however, there has not been a widespread or even a small-scale turn to pantheism among feminist philosophers or theologians. Rather, pantheism in the West continues to serve as a limit position at best and a nasty name at worst for thinkers of nearly every school and political persuasion. And again, I'm trying to understand why. Part three. The stated objections to pantheism are numerous and often perplexingly opposed to one another. Pantheists are variously charged with materialism and with anti-materialism, with irrationality and with excessive rationality, with fanaticism, with coldness, with idealism, with mechanism. Whatever the author's position may be, the pantheist rhetorically incarnates its extreme opposite. And the thickest complex of conflicting accusations turns on Bale's first charge against Spinoza. Well, technically the second. His first charge was that he was a Jew. Okay, fine. The second, the one that carries throughout Bale's essay, is that Spinoza was an atheist. At first, it might seem baffling, even incoherent, to call Spinoza an atheist. As Novalis famously intoned, Spinoza was a God-intoxicated man. Everywhere he looks, Spinoza sees the essence and existence of God. Thus, Goethe similarly reminds us that Spinoza does not have to prove the existence of God. Existence is God. So if Spinoza's God is all things, then how can this all God be no thing? How does pantheism become atheism? There are two major lines of thinking that produce this conclusion. The first is theological, insisting that the word God means a disembodied, singular, omnipotent, and personal, specifically fatherly force outside the universe. So the pantheist's material, multiple, non-anthropic God is from this perspective just not God. For the theists, to see God everywhere is to see him nowhere. In short, the phrase God or nature is conceptually incoherent, right? Because what God is, is not nature. It's a conceptual problem. The second line of thinking is more philosophical than theological. With Arthur Schopenhauer, it reasons that calling the world divine doesn't add anything to the concept of world, maybe the best sentence in all of Western philosophy. Against pantheism, I have mainly the objection that it states nothing. What he means is that a universe that is God is materially and functionally equivalent to a universe without God. So why try to dress up the world with divinity just to avoid being called an atheist? As Nancy Frankenberry explains, by assimilating God to nature, pantheists raise the suspicion that one of the two of them is semantically superfluous, right? The world with, it's just, why just, just delete, just be honest and delete God. Now, from the foregoing objections, we might think it's clear which term is superfluous. God, right? After all, the pantheist world is self-sufficient and auto-creative, so it doesn't seem to need divinity. And yet, we've already seen a slew of other critiques leveled precisely the opposite charge against pantheism. By swallowing all things into God, they argue pantheism eliminates not God, but the world. The adjective that Hegel uses to describe this Spinozan effect. Are you ready for this picture of Hegel? You ready? You ready? You ready? What's it going to look like? Oh. It's acosmism. So strictly is there only God, Hegel blusters, that there is no world at all, right? That the pantheist God just like swallows everything into God. For Hegel and a slew of his later Christian and Jewish readers, the anti-pantheist complaint amounts to a charge of what Franz Rosenzweig called Gleichmacherei, or making everything the same in German. God and nature, necessity and freedom, good and evil, pantheism seems to smush it all into one gigantic mess, or in the words of D.H. Lawrence, an awful pudding of one identity. At this point, however, one might want to ask whether the only available options out there are a two-column hierarchy on the one hand and an awful pudding on the other. One might even, like, is there anything else on the menu? One might even go so far as to ask whether when it comes down to it, the theistic two is really so different from this puddingish one. 
After all, this metaphysical framework that opposes God to world and male to female, colonizer to colonizer, doesn't establish the second as genuinely different from the first, so much as a derivation or a bad copy of it. Think here of Judith Butler, Homi Baba. The oppositional logic of classic metaphysics doesn't really give us two at all. It gives us one, and then a kind of like sad falling short of that one. From this perspective, we can see that the real concern over pantheism isn't the collapse of some abstract notion of difference. It's rather the loss of one particularly insistent and damaging way of configuring difference oppositionally. A configuration that gathers each instance of difference into a static category, benevolently overseen by a metaphysical life partner and then gathered into a coherent whole. Speaking of life partners, Congratulations on your wedding yesterday. <laughs> We've already detected an anxiety over gender and sexuality woven through 19th century projections of dark Eastern pantheists. In these texts, a feminized passivity marks the dreamlike Indian sage who in his erotic reverie attributes divinity even to dark and earthbound things. In more contemporary repudiations of pantheism, these racialized projections go underground as authors focus more explicitly on the category of gender. The gendered language is so pervasive, in fact, that Jansen establishes this whole horror of pantheism as a straightforward gender panic. As she argues, the fear of pantheism bespeaks a perceived, if unconscious, threat to the masculinist symbolic of the West. Jansen detects such a threatened masculinity in the surprisingly recurrent language of pantheism's swallowing, consuming, and assimilating all otherwise free beings into some dark abyss whose racial characteristics Jansen seems both to sort of notice and not notice. As she puts it, from a psychoanalytic perspective, one could speculate about what dread of the mother and the maternal womb lurks just below the surface of this fear of pantheism. What exactly is this abyss? the horror of great undifferentiated darkness into which at all costs we must not be sucked. Jansen is thinking here primarily of figures like Hegel, Schelling, and Kierkegaard. Hegel refers to pantheism as an abyss of annihilation, an abyss of one identity, but this fear of being pantheistically swallowed by a dark maternal monster can be found even in the lesser known writings of the 19th century. And I'm going to skip through this stuff, but we're back to the, we're back to Dix and we're, blah, 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 blah. Um, what we get is this fear of basically being sucked back into the primordial waters of Tehom of the uh, pre-cosmic um, sea out of which God then pulls these oppositions. We're all going to be sort of decreated uh, back into uh, Tehom. We find such a fear epitomized in D.H. Lawrence's often hilarious, deeply troubling diatribe against Walt Whitman. Remember Walt Whitman? Here goes D.H. Lawrence. I am everything, and everything is me, and so we're all one in one identity. He's sort of quipping. He's thinking here of Walt Whitman's ecstatic enfolding of all creatures, his self encompassing atoms and bicycles and choruses and steam trains and workers and America, and Lawrence just can't stand it. All that fake exuberance, all those lists of things boiled in one pudding cloth. No, no, I don't want all those things inside me, thank you. And there's our gender panic. Even for the notoriously lascivious D.H. freaking Lawrence, right? Whitman has made himself too porous, too penetrable, too queer. A pipe open at both ends so everything runs through. Men and women and Brooklyn and bees. Whitman's pantheism makes him the feminine recipient of all of them, including Lawrence Bristles, and here comes the race beneath the gender, quote, uh, an Eskimo in a kayak, little and yellow and greasy. All of these things are inside Lawrence. At the same time as it is universally invaded, Whitman's soul is also infinitely dispersed, promiscuously scattered, Lawrence shudders into, quote, the dark limbs of Negroes, the vagina of the prostitute, unquote. Now, if you've read any D.H. Lawrence, you will know that his revulsion at Whitman's pantheism is not the product of some commitment to theological orthodoxy or to Victorian sexuality. 
nor does it stem from an adherence to self-proclaimed philosophical rigor. He's not a philosopher. Rather, his revulsion at Whitman's pantheism is prompted by the bodily intermingling, the entanglement. It polyamorously enacts. Lawrence's Whitman is a monster, mixing activity and passivity, creation and reception, male and female, black and white, the poet and the construction worker, the indigenous and the settler, into what Lawrence calls an enormous one, but which frankly looks more like an unruly multitude. Of course, it all depends on what you mean by this multitude and what we mean by pantheism. Part four, this is the last one, here we go. I mentioned toward the beginning of this lecture the definitions of pantheism are rather dramatically variant from one another. Etymologically, the term means all God. But what does anybody mean by all? The Encyclopedia of Philosophy defines pantheism as the two-pronged assertion that everything that exists constitutes a unity and that this unity is divine. By contrast, the Rutledge Encyclopedia of Philosophy, defines pantheism as the view that deity and cosmos are identical. Now these, I'd like to point out, are wildly different definitions, and they tend toward wildly different ontologies. The first hinges the pantheist position on unity, whereas the second hinges it on imminence, right? The first says everything is one, the second says God is the material world. These aren't opposite claims, they're just really different things to say. And because they're not opposed to one another, it would certainly be possible to affirm both of them at once. One could say, for example, that the deity is the unity or the sum, that's the first definition, of the physical cosmos, that's the second definition. But it's also possible to affirm the first while rejecting the second, saying that deity is a unity that exists not within the cosmos, but in some ineffably essential spiritual or otherworldly realm. Conversely, one could affirm the second while rejecting the first by claiming that the cosmos is divine, but it is not, in fact, a unity. Ultimately, this string of rival definitions stems from an etymological duplicity in theism's pawn. Does all mean the all, or does it mean all things? I asked this once of a friend of mine who's a, a scholar of Greek language and literature, and she was like, holy hell, I've never thought of this question. What, what does pan mean? Is path, pantheism's cosmic divinity one, or is it many? These two different meanings of pan map onto a rarely discussed distinction that William James, that dude, makes between monistic and pluralistic pantheisms. For the monist, James explains, the world is one tremendous unity in which everything is present to everything else in one vast, instantaneous, co-implicated completeness. For the pluralist, by contrast, the things of the world are in some respects connected and in other respects independent so that they're not members of one all-inclusive individual fact. Monism tells us everything is connected to everything else. Pluralism affirms that connections come and go. Monism is the philosophy of the absolute, of idealism, of what James calls the all form, while pluralism opts for empiricism and the each form, thinking that there may never be an all form at all. Now, of course, James is a pragmatist, so he knows he can't say which of these visions is ultimately true, or if it even makes sense to speak this way. But James sides with pluralism for a host of ethical, political, and psychological reasons. If we insist that everything in existence is one, he says, then we're last left asking why some parts of this unity so often step out of line with it. We then demonize difference as evil, or we call particularities inessential to focus on some abstract whole. But if we affirm a messy plurality rather than a perfect totality, then differences are signs of health rather than pathology. Evil calls for a practical response rather than a speculative explanation. And our everyday particular experiences of Beyonce and bees and belonging amount to intimacy with the universe itself. For all of these reasons, James opts for pluralism, which makes of the universe what he calls a multiverse. He makes up this word multiverse, we can talk about that too. A loosely coherent, evolving chain of complex connections that's never quite all in all. Here's the way he explains it. 
This type of pluralist union, it's true, is different from the monistic type of all Einheit, all oneness. He's always making fun of Germans. Um, it's not a universal co-implication of or integration of all things durcheinander through one another. It's what I call the strung along type, the type of continuity, contig contiguity, or concatenation. So here's the thing. Unlike almost any other self-proclaimed philosopher, William James actually professes a pantheist position. And almost like, unlike all other positions accused of pantheism, this pantheism doesn't make all things one, nor does it capitulate to theisms two. Rather, a Jamesian pantheism would manage to count higher than two, higher even than the Trinitarian three, and locate divinity in the endless multiplicity of the material world itself. Unfortunately, James does not go on to say what such a pluralist pantheism might look like. My sense is that his strung along concatenation would constitute a queerer, more metaphysically disruptive, and therefore more ethically promising pantheism than the monistic totality would. A pluralist pantheism, if there were such a thing, would allow us to think of divinity not just as bound up with, but as equivalent to the autopoetic multiverse in all its vibrant materiality, complex emergence, interdetermination and intra-active entanglement, which is to say, as the subject, object, means, medium, and end of our innumerable ecological strivings. Thanks. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Rubenstein, for sharing with us. That was fabulous, and you have given us all much to think about as we're moving through the rest of the day. Um, we have some time for question and answer. Um, Chris is going to bring around a microphone, and then we have some other announcements quick before we do that. Oh, after. Never mind. Okay, question and answer time. So, yes. Oh, wait, one second. Really, uh, so much <laughs> appreciate your remarks. Uh, you began in the Enlightenment period with your critique. W w uh, would you also just make a comment about the biblical uh, injunction against the so-called pantheism or the nature attention of the neighbors to Israelite? Uh, the, oh, 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 so the prescriptions against idolatry, etc. Yes. Yeah, so... Sure, yeah, so certainly the early modern um, Christian theologians, and it's Christian theologians, I mean, so, oh, right, did, did, did Spinoza get excommunicated by his Jewish community? Yes, absolutely, right, so this is an anti-Jewish position too, this conflation of God and the material world, um, because what God is is precisely not the material world. Um, certainly we know from the prophetic tradition in the Hebrew Bible that like the big mistake is conflating divinity with material like that's the big that's the big one okay. that's the big one right um, this is that you should what should I do when I get into Canaan oh you should burn their stuff and burn their temples and don't marry their wives because they're going to make you idolaters and what they mean by making you idolaters is that they're going to be uh, teaching you to uh, affirm the divinity of something material right so this is this is this is, this is like this is the big one idolatry is the big one the thing that's funny is that the people who are particularly exercised about this conflation, I mean, the Jews are just like, no, that's dumb, but they don't spend a lot of time talking about it. It's Christian intellectuals and post-Christian intellectuals who find it so particularly revolting. And the thing that's so interesting is that it's the Christian move to say that divinity itself has crashed you know, kinetically into the created world. The divinity shows up in as a particular human. And of course, what happens in the 19th century is that our, our Hegels and our, our, our Schellings uh, say that what the doctrine of the incarnation is trying to do is to say 
that actually divinity is revealed in all of humanity or all of the world or something that it's a it's a um like a little sort of instructive tale for it so i think part of the reason that christian philosophers get so particularly exercised about pantheism is that they're kind of close to it right they again the jewish philosophers can just be like that's terrible um, but they don't have anything baked into their central doctrine of divinity that leads toward this position, and Christians do. They really do. And it's a, and again, it's a, um, a fairly common uh, interpretation in the 19th century of the incarnation, that the incarnation was meant to be uh, sort of universally understood. This is what drives Kierkegaard nuts, right? Kierkegaard's like, stop it! Stop divinizing the whole damn world! It's one dude! One guy in occupied Palestine! Otherwise it's not a paradox, otherwise it's not a... But Kierkegaard wouldn't have had to yell so loud if it hadn't been uh, so, so omnipresent. So I, 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 I know I'm not talking so much about like Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus here, but this is, I, I think it's an easier position for Jewish philosophy to dismiss than it is for Christian philosophy to dismiss because Christian philosophy is like, oh damn, I've got a God in a, in a guy body. Like that's a, this is a, pro right? So then it becomes a particular um, seduction for Christian philosophy and a particular, uh, there's a particularly uh, uh, strenuous need to keep it at a distance. Right? Yeah, thank you so much. We can do one more short uh, question. Thank you so much, Hi. Lisa Dayhill. Um, I love your work, and um, just uh, um, within all the resonance I find um, with your thinking and on many, many levels, I want to just note that what I heard in your talk this time for the first time that, I didn't, that didn't strike me so powerfully is just a, another way of stating this irony of um, these, the as you're putting it, the Christians are the ones who are most vociferously denouncing the very heart of their own confession, yeah. um, is, is how the language that you noted of decreation, the fear of pantheism as decreation, mm -hmm. sort of undoing those primal Genesis 1 distinctions that give rise to the world in, the, in this original G Genesis 1 imagination, back to the tehom. Mm -hmm. um, this fear of that and we have to defend against that at all costs and we have to uphold these distinctions and those are the things by which the world is ordered and creation itself exists that the upholding of those distinctions is precisely what is now actually literally decreating the world mm -hmm. and so in the language of Cynthia Molubita, mm -hmm. ethicist she talks about um, uh, we are now we have become the uncreators mm -hmm. we are the ones undoing the, the, f the abundance and the flourishing and the magnificence of creation erasing this divine presence throughout the world, species by species by species, and ecosystem by yeah. life system. We are the decreate, we are the uncreators, she mm -hmm. says, and so precisely those who are so uh, concerned to uphold these distinctions in order to prevent reversion to decreation are doing that very thing. Are doing that very are thing. Are doing it, yeah. like literally. Yeah, that's a, wiping that's it a out. really so. beautiful point, and I think that, that here I would, I would commend to all of us to read again Catherine Keller's Face of the Deep and remember that the, the issue theologically then that get, then gets entrenched as techno science that gets entrenched as capitalist extraction that gets, again, right, it doesn't really matter anymore what theologians are saying but what matters is what these theological ideas are now doing um, the problem is the uh, zero sum game in the church fathers uh, between the two and the nothing right so it's precisely the eclipse of Tehom it's right that it's the problem is that nothing can come out of that that there's nothing other than the insistence of the two and the instrumentalizing of the one by the other on the one hand or nothing those are our only possibilities right so we're right so we're gonna go for if it can't be two I guess it's gonna have to be nothing right yeah thank you yeah Are we done all right thanks <laughs>